Welcome, my friends, to the Bob and Brad podcast. My name is Mike Keenitz, and I'm a physical therapist assistant. Our guest today is Dr. Datis Karazian. Dr. Karazian is a Harvard Medical School trained and award winning clinical research scientist academic professor, and world-renowned functional medicine healthcare provider. He develops evidence-based models to treat autoimmune, neurological, and unidentified chronic diseases with non-pharmaceutical applications. His clinical models of evidence-based medicine are used by several academic institutes and thousands of healthcare providers throughout the world. Dr. Karazian is an associate clinical professor at the Loma Linda University School of Medicine. So without further ado, here is Dr. Karazian. All right, let's get into talking about the gut-brain access. What is it? Yeah, this is a major, major area of uh, research. It's exploding. There's even journals now focused just on the gut-brain access. Right. Basically, what it is, is the GI tract impacts the brain. And, you know, the, the problem is the whole body, maybe part of the body packs each other. Uh, but when we, you know, when you look at how the human body was taught, human physiology was taught, they started with just what they visibly could see. They could see a big liver. They could see, you know, then you have your hepatologist. They can then see a big gut, gastroenterologist, and that's a heart, and the cardiologist. And they kind of got segmented by visual gross anatomy is how different medical specialties got put together, right? Mm -hmm. In reality, like there's cytokines, messengers, prostanoids, prostaglandins, hormones, all these signal agents that impact all of these, these systems together. And if you were to train physiology now, I think if you started from signaling molecules, right, first, then you wouldn't have all the subspecialties we have the way they have. We have them, but oh well. We are, yeah. We are, right. Uh, it'll be generations before that changes. But the, the key thing is different systems impact each other, which is very, very clearly understood. Um, when you look at these messenger systems instead of gross anatomy organs. So there's a lot of messengers from the gut that directly impact the brain and vice versa. So the gut has bacteria, right? And these bacteria uh, collectively are called the microbiome. And the microbiome, these bacteria, they produce things like, lipo, like lipo, what are called lipopolysaccharides. They actually produce hormones. They actually produce things like dopamine, serotonin, neurotransmitters. They, they produce gut peptide hormones like CCK, so these bacteria in our gut are not just bacteria for no reason. They're actually metabolically active, right? And when they look at the microbiome and they look at the gut, one of the, uh, there's been a human microbiome project and a huge effort in studying the microbiome in the past 20 years. They haven't found like the perfect good bacteria, but what they have consistently found like, across all types of research is how diverse your gut microbiome will determine better resiliency to be healthy than unhealthy. So the more bacteria species you have, the more potential they have for these bacteria to balance you out when things go wrong. So some gut bacteria will produce dopamine. Some gut bacteria will produce an anti-inflammatory messenger. Some gut bacteria will produce a gut peptide, right? So more diverse your gut bacteria is gut diverse your microbiome is, the more as your body shifts where things go wrong, they can come in and balance things out. So the, the microbiome in the gut is, is an area of, tremendous uh, growth in, in the research world of understanding how it impacts your body. And, and part of it is the brain. So what they find is there's these bacteria, these, you know, what they call them postbiotics, these messengers, the bacteria produce something that's called a postbiotic, these messenger systems that then impact the brain. And they can impact mood, like uh, certain probiotics, you know, I mean, taking some probiotics yourself or at some point, certain probiotics yeah. don't impact mood. They're, they're now in the field called psychobiotics. And the gastroenterology research is an entire field of researchers that are now just psychobiotic researchers. All they do is study psychobiotics. That's okay. a very interesting term. <laughs> yeah, very interesting term. And then there's there's uh, people that are studying the microbiome or, or just starting or just looking at something called lipopolysaccharide. And like gram negative lipopolysaccharides create inflammation all throughout the body. And then there's another variations of this like lipopolysaccharide A. In animal studies, is showing it's curing autoimmune disease. Like they can cure animal models of autoimmune disease when they increase lipopolysaccharide A. It turns on what are called regular T cells, and animal models of MS are now like going into remission. And it's like, wow. So this is part of the uh, gut-brain access is how the gut impacts our health. But when you, you know, there's a gut-brain access, there's a gut-liver access, right? There's a gut-pulmonary access, there's a gut. Uh, joint access. There's, there's all these different accesses as, as these systems arise. So that's the gut-brain axis. And 
ultimately it's like your gut has to, an ideal scenario to have the most efficient gut brain access. Is you have a, the, as diverse of a microbiome as you can have. And then I can, t- I can, and I can tell you about things that can help diversify the microbiome that we understand now. And then it's not like taking a probiotic. <laughs> it's, it's more complicated. Yeah. And, more, and then you have to have your gut have tight junctions. So there's that thing called leaky gut. You have to have intestinal problem, but your tight junctions are going to have to be closed so undigested food can't cross. And you have to have what's called immune tolerance in the gut. So there's different types of immune cells in the gut like that are called regulatory T cells or dendritic cells, and they have to not overreact and have to have a proportional response. And there has to be something called secretary IgA, which is an immunoglobulin that coats the gut and, and prevents for exaggerated immune response to take place. Those all have to be there to have the healthiest gut. If you have that healthiest gut, not only is it going to impact your brain function, is what this research is showing, but it's going to impact Hashimoto's disease, like we talked about, inflammation, autoimmune diseases. There's a lot of strong links now in the research to why some people get long COVID because of their microbiome dysfunctions and some of these mechanisms that put them at risk. Um, so it's, it's very fascinating. So the gut brain axis is really just looking at the gut, but really how it impacts brain. And, and, and when the microbiome and all these things go wrong, They've been shown that it can cause depression, it's shown it can cause anxiety disorders, basically everything. It shows it can cause uh, autoimmune diseases of the brain, like multiple sclerosis, um, and, and uh, those are the relationships. Now, there's also a brain-gut access, which is another whole other group of researchers and another group of journals that published on that, and they found the brain actually impacts the gut. <laughs> so it can go either way? <laughs> either way. So huh. the brain, the brain has a pathway to the gut called the vagus nerve. So the, the brain has goes into brainstem. There's a branch called the vagus nerve, the wandering nerve that goes directly and innervates the gut. And this this vagus nerve controls autonomic function of the gut. Autonomic function being things like getting blood flow to the gut, causing you to contract your gallbladder so you can release bile to digest fats, causing uh, release of digestive enzymes so you can break down your foods, um, activating <clears throat> neurologically the immune cells in the gut to kick in. So you have good immune function in the gut. So lots of studies show people get head trauma. They get disruption in their brain gut access. And even within two or three hours in animal studies, they can see their, they get leaky gut, their gut gets inflamed, their immune system in the gut disrupts. Uh, they can see relationships between neurogenic diseases, having impaired brain gut access issues. So it's like this interrelationship between the gut brain access and then brain gut access that's involved. And, you know, you have people that have like um, a traumatic brain injury. Maybe they were in a car accident, maybe lost their consciousness, or maybe they were young, they played football and were unconscious and they injured their brain and they didn't notice anything then. But five years later, 10 years later, 15 years later, now they're getting the expressions of it. This is what's called a post-traumatic encephalopathy, which is the term used where the brain gets injured and the inflammation continues to grow like a forest fire. And over a period of years, enough neurons are injured and damaged from it that there's some symptoms that are expressed. And one of the symptoms people will express besides like minutes cognitive decline or depression or mood changes and all things that come with it is their gut doesn't work. <laughs> now they have this chronic constipation. Now they have these chronic DHGI issues and they have chronic bloating and they can get some relief with changing some things in their diet, but it's really a brain gut access issue. I talk about that in my brain book. Why is my brain working? I have a whole chapter on the brain gut and gut brain access and uh, how to clinically, you know, how these things evolve, but like these things are all real in in healthcare. Like this, these are all known in the scientific literature. These aren't like made up theories. These are, you know, how the body works, physiology. But people then suffer from these dysfunctions. They walk into healthcare, and they don't know what to do. And this yeah. is not like a conventional alternative. They walk into alternative. They're going to give them a probiotic. The other one's conventional. They're going to give them, I don't know, stool softener or something like <laughs> that. Or, I, 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 and, and this is this is the frustration like as an outsider looking in i go oh my god people have no chance like literally have no chance when they so start you, to get you offer like different programming courses on your website right i do and it, and and, and it, it's an attempt to serve some some degree of it but it's not like i have i don't have all the answers i'm just trying to get some 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 reliable information in a digital format out to people that may may help to some degree. Really what we need is greater adaptation of research into clinical practice. Like that's what needs to happen. We need to have a different way to train healthcare professionals, both conventional alternative. We have to have shifts in the insurance model, health policy to make the biggest change, you know? So I don't, I don't have the answers with my online program, my book. Right. I'm just trying to 
as an observer go, Hey, I have some information that you should know about. Like maybe it can help you on your journey, you know, but um, I spend most of my time actually treating, uh, uh, but working with healthcare professionals as, edu as an educator. So I have an uh, institute called the Cross Institute. We have about 3,000 physician healthcare professionals who are learning evidence based healthcare. And I have, like, on my on the Cross Institute website, I have a practitioner located where they can find a practitioner if looking for someone. But um, it's, it's complicated. And I think when people develop chronic diseases, they definitely need a personalized, individualized approach because all these variables and factors are involved and you have to look at them. You know, the classic model of medicine is you come in to get a diagnosis and then there's a the treatment and the treatment is a drug, right? All right. And the, and the model for alternative medicine is not really much better. You come in to get the diagnosis and now you get a supplement. They call that green medicine, right? <laughs> so sure. it's, it's very lean, you know? Diagnosis drug, diagnosis not drug, supplement, because supplement's safer, right? And, then, and that's what they think, and that's what they go through. But it, in reality, it's, it's it's not it's not a linear single variable. The, the, the diagnosis has multiple variables in it, and each of those variables expressed differently. So you have to look at all those variables to make the biggest change. And 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 for some things, a single linear model is of course easy and it makes the most sense, like an infection, bacterial infection, antibiotic, perfect linear model. That's what you need. With chronic disease and autoimmune diseases, things like Hashimoto's diseases, things like traumatic brain injuries that are impacting the brain gut axis, all these other things, it's a multivariate model. And this is where you need personal, personalized, individualized approaches. And that's what's difficult. And unfortunately, we have, you know, insurance healthcare policy program where you can't have a healthcare professional spend three hours doing history on a patient. No, I I think there's a few alternative in other countries that are trying to do that, but it's not common at all in the U.S. Okay. And there's some places like the Cleveland Clinic uh, has a functional medicine center where people can get more personalized lifestyle approach approaches in there. They, they just published a great paper, I think, last year, Journal of Journal American Medical Association, the online version journal, where they showed outcomes between treating non-responsive inflammatory bowel disease with a conventional approach to functional medicine approach at the Cleveland Clinic with dramatic changes in outcomes. Mm -hmm. So th there's there's some attempts to make some of these changes. Um, I teach at Loma Linda University School of Medicine and, and uh, we have a fourth year uh, option class for medical students where they can learn individualized lifestyle medicine approaches, functional medicine approaches that many of them get very interested in. You know, And, and the thing is, is these, these physicians too that are in training like they, they just want to know, they want to know, like, you know, it's not this big conspiracy. It's just, it's a complex model. And to, to go from the linear model we have now to a complex model is just slow and hard to do. And then also many practitioners, like uh, yeah, just, just to get a different point of view, like I meet practitioners all the time going, Hey, I've been practicing medicine as a family physician for all these years. I really want to do personalized lifestyle medicine. I just don't know how I can support my family if I do that, because how much is it, if I'm doing a three hour history on a new patient and I can maybe see two of them in a day, how right. am I, They're what am I going to charge them yeah. to then be able to go to my office, my malpractice insurance and my staff and everything else that's involved with expenses and then have any money left over. Right. So then you get in a situation where you have, we have physicians with all the intent wanting to do all the right things. They just can't make the model work. It's very hard for them to make it work, right? All right. And then they can get insurance coverage for it. And then like, what do they charge for the first appointment? Is it $500? Is it $1,000? Yeah, it has to be somewhat reasonable well, for the clientele. Yeah, and then and so now we are kind of forced with a healthcare model where money becomes an issue because like the healthcare professional has overheads, expenses and staff and all the things required to manage their case, right? Someone's got to, help run the office and organize things and build appointments. And and then they have to support their own family. And now you have this area where even people with the best interests are the, are having a hard time doing this. So when you find them, they're, they're all, they're all busy. And unfortunately, you know, people that need them sometimes can't afford them and people that can't afford them can't find them and people it, it's, it's a problem. Yeah. All right. So where can people find you at on your websites and where can they get your books? So my website is Dr. K News, D-R-K-N-E-W-S.com, Dr. K News, because my last name is Karazian and that's 
really order spell. <laughs> so I use Dr. K News. Uh, and then I had, do have uh, I do have free uh, content on that, uh, including a gluten in the brain book. So if there's a free online gluten brain book, if you want to check that out, uh, if you're listening. And we have lots of podcasts and videos and information trying to educate the public. And the goal of the website is to, uh, you know, edu- to educate the public and let them eventually know about the books I've written. I've written two books, one on, on the brain, one on the thyroid. And we have some online courses on the brain, thyroid, for sensitivities, food allergies, to try to get information out to people. But uh, hopefully it can be a good educational source for those that are interested in, in these topics. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Okay. Thanks, Mike. It's a pleasure and uh, talk to you soon.